All right, so just a couple of quick things uh, first. Uh, we're only meeting for class three more times, right? And then we'll meet one final time during the finals period to do peer review. Um, so the next two texts that you're going to be reading are in the anthology. You're going to be reading um, A Rays in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry for next time. And for the following Wednesday, you're going to be reading uh, Fences by August Wilson. And then the last thing we're going to be reading is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead by Tom Stoppard, and that is in a separate book. So for next time, read the Hansberry, and I want you to think about the following. Right? One thing that I think often kind of slips by people's radar, we tend to think of grandmas as sweet and cuddly, but I want you to pay attention to the way Lena, the grandmother in A Raisin in the Sun, treats her adult children. Right? Remember that Walter and Benita are grown-ups. Does she actually let them have their own beliefs or opinions? And so what that she does or doesn't? I also want you to think about how Walter feels about his job and to what extent that affects the way he treats the rest of his family. And finally, Walter's younger sister, Benita, has two suitors, right? You know, two guys who come after her. Um, one is a young, wealthy man named George. The other is a Nigerian man named Joseph. And I want you to think about the alternative choices that these two present to her. <clears throat> one more thing that I want you to be aware of. Um, course evaluations have to be done by April 24th, right? We don't do that in class. There's a link you can go to in Georgia View, right, that'll take you to the evaluation for this class. Just Fill out the evaluation form, be honest about it, right? I use it when I get it back to improve the class for future semesters, right? I really do want your honest feedback. You know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna cost me my job, right? I'm not gonna get thrown out on the street. Um, I do wanna know honestly though, what worked for you and what didn't work in this class. So please do go and fill out the course evaluations by the 24th. Um, okay, so anybody have any questions about anything? About anything we have to do in the next couple weeks, about course evaluations, about life, the universe, and everything? Yeah, Darius. <clears throat> what is the rough draft doing here? The rough draft is due on the day that we meet for peer review. So I think that's May 1st, right? Okay. Are we bringing it in? Yep, bring it to class. We'll split, up into, we'll split you up into groups, and you'll go over each other's papers. Okay. And then you'll upload the paper for me to look at by midnight that night. May 1st? May 1st. Okay. I think it's May 1st. Yeah. It's on the syllabus. So yeah. Okay. yeah. Anything else? All right. How did Mother Courage go for you? Cool. Pardon? Cool. Cool? <laughs> what was cool about it? I was weird a little bit. Our kids. Okay. Right, we've got the three children. Right. Ilif. Swiss, Swiss cheese. And Katrin. Did everybody get the joke why he's called Swiss cheese? Yeah, because he's executed by firing squad, shot with 11 bullets. So, yeah, he's originally given the name, his mother says, because his father was Swiss. But the name fits him because of the way he dies. Shot full of holes. A little dark, grim joke on Brett's part. 
Um, okay, so what are these children like? Um, <clears throat> he, um, what is it, how do you say Goliath? I, I live. I live. He's smart. Uh-huh. Yes, he's the clever one. I think Swiss is the dumb one. Hmm? She's the dumb one, but she calls Kat Katrin the dumb one too. Yeah, well, Katrin is dumb, but when, when she calls Katrin dumb, she doesn't mean the same thing, right? Uh -huh. When she calls Katrin, she means that she's mute. She can't speak. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's only mute, we're told later on, as a result of the war but she, because of an injury. But she's real nice, though. Yeah. Katrin is kind. And it's mute, yeah. She can't speak. She can only sort of grunt. Now, what about, in addition to being stupid, what's Swiss cheese like? Blatantly honest. Yeah. yeah. Honest pretty much to a fault, right? What's the best accommodations? And what is it that gets each of these children killed? Why does Ilif die? Well, that's why Katrin dies, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which one? Yeah, Katrin dies because she can't stand the thought of children in that in the adjacent city being hurt in the attack, right? So she gets up with that drum and beats the drum to wake up the sleeping city to let them know the army's coming. And that gets her shot. Now, what is it that gets Swiss cheese killed? His mom, for real. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we could probably argue that at least on some level, Mother Courage gets all of them killed. But yeah, it's probably, it's most direct in Swiss cheese's case, yeah. Basically, his honesty. Yeah. Yeah, he's the treasurer for the regiment, right? And he refuses to just give the to, he refuses to give the cash box to the enemy. So because he's so honest, because he has to keep up this commission, right? That leads to his execution. And what about Ilif? Was he um? He's executed for um. He raided one village too many. Yeah, well... Yeah, because the pe some of the peasants, mm -hmm. he did something with the peasants. Yeah. Let's actually look at scene two, where Ilif is conversing with the general. Can I actually get a couple of volunteers here? Can I get an Ilif, a general, and a chaplain? All right, Ian, you be Ilif. Okay. All right, can I get a general? You said scene two? Scene two, yep. Yep, Frank, go ahead, you be the general, and I need a chaplain. Anybody? Anybody want to be the chaplain? What page is on? Um, 13, uh, 13 through 15. Okay. Anybody feeling like a holy hypocrite this morning? All right, Macy, go for it. Okay, so let's start at the bottom of page 13 with Ilif. Well, it was like this. Well, it was like this, see. I heard peasants had been driving the oxen they hid out of the forest in one particular wood on the sly, mostly by night. That's where people from the town were supposed to come and pick them up. So I holds off and lets them drive their oxen together, reckoning that he's better than me at finding them. I had my blood slavering after the meat. Cut their emergency rations further for a couple of days till their mouths was watered and at least the sound of any word beginning with me, like the measles say. Very clever view. Possibly. The rest was a piece of cake, except that the peasants had cudgels and outnumbered us three to one and made a murderous attack on us. Four of them shoved me into a thicket, knocked my sword from my hand and bawled out, surrender. What's the answer, I wondered. They're going to make my mince meat of me. What did you do? I laughed. You did what? 
laughed. So we got talking. I put a, a business footing from the start, told him, 20 florins a head's too much. I'll give you 15. And I was meaning to pay. That, that threw them, and, and they began scratching their heads. In a flash, I picked up my sword and was hacking them to pieces. Necessity is the mother of invention, eh, sir? What is your view, pastor of souls? That phrase is not strictly speaking in the Bible, but when our Lord turned the five loaves into five hundred, there was no war at all, and he could tell people to love their neighbors if they had enough to eat. Today is another story. Quite another story. You can have a swig after all the, after all for that, you little fairies. Hack them to, bit, to pieces, did you? So my gallant lads can get a proper bite to eat. What do the scriptures say? Whatsoever thou dost it for, <clears throat> whatsoever thou dost it for, at least of my brethren, thou dost it for me. And what did you do for them? Got them a good square meal of beef, because they're not accustomed to moldy bread. The old way was to fix cold meal rolls and wine in your helmet before you went out to fight for God. I, in a flash, had picked up my sword and was hacking them to pieces. You've the makings of a young Caesar. You ought to see the king. I have from a distance. He kind of glows. I'd like to model myself on him. All right, you guys can stop there. Thank you. All right, so very well done. Good job, all three of you. Now, so what is Iliff? Does this look? Does what Iliff has done here look to us like a deed of heroism? It looks like he's gone and killed a bunch of uh, common folk and stolen their stuff. Yeah, he's Bad killed. Tree. Yeah. He's killed a bunch of peasants and taken their cattle for the army to eat. Now, well, yeah. But in wartime, this makes him a hero, right? To the general. So, right. All right, you got my lads a good square meal of beef. Good for you. Well done. You get a commendation and a promotion and a swig of good wine. Well done, young man. Now, what happens when he performs exactly the same action during peacetime? Executed. Yeah. It's not heroic anymore when the war's off. You can't behave the same way in peacetime that you did in wartime and expect to be rewarded for it. Right. What's heroism in war is criminal in peace. And one thing Brecht is trying to do here is draw that contrast, right? That war is a kind of glorification of what is essentially criminal behavior. So, We ought to think as well about how this relates to the play's general attitude towards commerce. Since how does Iliff trick the peasants? Claiming mean, he's going to buy it. Yeah, he pretends he's there to pay, right? They knock him into the thicket. He's disarmed. He thinks quick. And he tries to paint it as a business deal, right? Now, where do you learn that kind of trick from? His mother? Yeah. And how does Mother Courage make her living? By following the armies around and selling to both sides. Yep. Most of the characters in the play are what are called camp followers. Anybody ever heard this term before? Anybody know what a camp follower is? Okay, yeah, what's a camp follower? It's someone who would uh, trail beyond, behind the army and offer services and goods to both sides. Yeah, um, well, ge generally, usually only to the side they're following, but they don't necessarily care that much which side that is, right? Yeah, camp followers were by and large people who were dependent on the, they're not, they're not combatants, they're not soldiers, they don't fight. But yeah, they are people who follow the army around and are dependent on the army for money and for upkeep. Right, so a merchant like Mother Courage. Right, the chaplain. 
the cook. And Yvette, the prostitute, would all be examples of camp followers. They don't have a rank, they don't have an official position, but they make their living off the war. Much as Mother Courage does with her car. And how do Mother Courage's business dealings relate to the fates of her children? Oh, um, Swiss cheese. Okay, yeah, we see it most directly with Swiss cheese, right? Swiss cheese could have been saved, right? Yeah, and wasn't she like selling something like a. Mm -hmm. Um, she wagon on loan. Uh huh. Yes, but if she'd sold it outright and been willing to pay all the money she got for it, she could have saved Swiss cheese, right? If she'd paid the full 200 florins that the Catholic army was asking and not haggled, he would have been okay. But because She's thinking of herself, her money, and her profits. He dies. And she has to deny having known him. Where is she when Katrin dies? Off getting more stuff to sell. Yep, she's off buying more stock. When Eilith is taken away by the recruiter. Selling. Yeah, she's selling a belt buckle to the sergeant, right? She doesn't even notice the recruiter taking her son to make a soldier of him. She doesn't even know Ilif is dead, right? When he's being when he's brought to the cart to say goodbye before he's executed, she's not there. She's gone off to sell her excess stock so that she doesn't lose money during peacetime. So we don't really get a particularly admirable picture of this character, right? In fact, if we look at the way she got her name in the first place, <coughs> why she's called Mother Courage. Yeah, go ahead, Darius. It's like she was um, scared of being broke or something. Yeah, she was afraid of going broke. If we look on page three. Courage is the name they gave me because I was scared of going broke, Sergeant. So I drove me cart right through the bombardment of Riga with 50 loaves of bread aboard. They were going moldy, it was high time, hadn't any choice really. So that she's capable of feats of bravery when money's on the line. What else did you guys know, notice? Like apart from just the weird issue with the children and their special virtues. What else did you guys notice in this play? Anything else that was weird or particularly difficult about this play before I get too deep into any of this? How is the way this play is set up different from other plays that we've read? Oh, across a few years. Yeah. 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 It takes place over a broad timeline, right? Yeah. In a number of different places. The structure of this is really different, right? Right. If we look at Antig <laughs> if we look at a play like Antigone, like most Greek tragedies, that all takes place over about 24 hours. Yeah. Hamlet, all the action in that play takes place in a matter of weeks. A dollhouse takes place over the Christmas holiday, right? So again, over a very short span of time, entirely in the Helmer's apartment. So most of the plays we've looked at have focused on more or less one location and a very short span of time. Now what sorts of connections do those plays want you to forge with the characters in them? If we look, for example, at Antigone, what is Sophocles going for? What's the effect he's going for 
in a play like Antigone? What's its purpose supposed to be? What, what was the effect that a Greek playwright aimed at? Does anybody remember what it was called? Melancholy? Not melancholy. They were trying to purge the emotions. Exactly. Right, so you're supposed to, on some level, identify with the tragic hero. And as you observe that character's horrible fate, right, your negative emotions are purged out of you. Right? It's a communal purging of all of your negative emotions. So that you know, all of you, you know, good Greeks can then go back to being logical and Spock-like for the rest of the year. What about a play like Hamlet, right? With all the blood and sex in that play, what kind of response is Shakespeare ultimately trying to get out of you? Is he trying to get an intellectual response or an emotional response? Emotional. Absolutely an emotional response, right? Right. Seeing two guys slice each other up in the final act of a play, right? it's scary, right? but also kind of thrilling. What the tragedy of blood is supposed to be doing is giving you that kind of thrill, like a little bit of a sick thrill. Now, even if we look at a play like A Dollhouse that is directly addressing a contemporary social problem, is it addressing that problem in a particularly intellectualized way? No. Yeah, we're supposed to identify with the Helmers, right? Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to sort of feel our way through Ibsen's argument. So most drama is aimed at making you feel something. It's aim it aims at getting an emotional response out of you. Brecht does not want to touch your emotions. Virtually all of Bertolt Brecht's plays are essentially argument plays. Right? There's a particular thesis that he's trying to get across, and he doesn't want you falling into the action or identifying with the characters, because then you're going to miss the point of the play. So he relies a lot on what he calls alienation effects. And these are intended to keep you from getting wrapped up in the events in the play, to keep you from getting wrapped up in the lives of the characters, so that you don't miss the point, so that you don't miss the argument the play is trying to make. So for example, we have, as we just mentioned, that episodic structure, right? We don't have a fast-moving, continuous narrative. We have a play that covers a vast historical span, and most of what links the scenes together is that they happen to the same characters. We don't have that same kind of continuous narrative in this play. This is, again, to keep you from getting wrapped up in events. Now, another way he, gets, he keeps you from getting wrapped up in events, what does he tell you at the beginning of each scene? Yeah, you get that little summary at the beginning of each scene that tells you exactly what's going to happen in this scene, right? This event is about to occur. And those will actually be displayed, to, like those aren't just for the reader. Those are to be displayed to the audience before the scene begins, right? In earlier produ uh, productions, they'd be written on a sign. In contemporary uh, productions, they're usually broadcast up on a screen. So these scene summaries are meant to deflate any sense of suspense. There's no suspense because you already know what's going to happen. 
What about the general setting for this play? When does this take place? 18th, 16th, 20th. Yeah, 17th century during a conflict called the Thirty Years' War. Which ran from roughly 1618 to 1648. More on that in a minute. But Brett started writing this play in 1938 wasn't performed until 1949. <clears throat> so what kind of historical circumstances is he writing? If he's writing this play in Germany in 1938. In response to the beginning of World War II. Yeah, it hasn't started yet, right? The Nazis come to power in 1933. And by 1938, <coughs> the direction that Europe is moving in is pretty clear, right? There are various efforts by different European countries to try to avert war. For example, you know, various methods are taken to try to appease Hitler. You know, they give him parts of Czechoslovakia. They so give, they, they you know, they, they, right, Austria. they don't, don't challenge him in Poland, right? But none of it, none of it works. Now, Brecht had particular reasons to be concerned. One was political. He was a socialist. And the Nazis, despite the fact that Nazi, you know, Nazi translates to National Socialist Party, um, the Nazis weren't socialists. They were fascists. Right? They were extreme nationalists. Um, they didn't like socialists or communists. So politically, Brecht was in a difficult position. He was also married to a Jewish woman. Pardon? And the anti-Jew rhetoric of the Nazi Party had been around for quite some time. Sure. Well, I mean, you know, arguably since the since the Middle Ages. Um, well, just about political parties around the 20s. And anyway, <clears throat> Germany was getting really a little too hot for someone like Brecht. Now, Mother Courage is an expressly anti-war play. There's a more recent conflict he could have drawn on, though, right? Yeah, why do you think he didn't write about the First World War? Everyone remembered. Exactly. People in his audiences would have remembered the First World War, would have had strong feelings about it, might have served, might have had friends or relatives who served. people. Yeah. So the First World War would have tweaked their feelings. Now, how many of you know anything at all about the Thirty Years' War? Okay, you do because you're a history major. Do any of you give a shit about the Thirty Years' War? Of course you don't, right? This was, you know, you know this was 400 years ago on another continent. Right? <clears throat> this doesn't touch your conscience or your soul in any particular way, right? You don't remember it. Why would you? And Brecht is counting on his audiences not remembering this war as well, right? He chooses the Thirty Years' War because it's similar in some ways. It drew in just about every nation in Europe and some in Western Asia as well. But it's far enough in the past that people aren't going to have strong feelings about it. This is a common device he uses in his plays as well. He chooses remote historical eras or settings, again, to avoid getting the feelings involved. What about
about the cast of this play? How big is the cast of this play? If you wanted to put on a production of this, how many people would you need? Quite a lot. Yeah, this is a, there are a lot of characters, right? Now, most theater companies wouldn't have the budget to hire that many people, right? Can't pay that many actors. So what do you think then this play is probably designed for? Double casting. Yep, multiple casting. That is exactly what Brecht intended. That different actors will play the same part. Well, that the same actors will play different parts. And often they will change their costumes before your very eyes. Right. Costume changes are done on stage. Scene changes are done by the actors while you're watching. So you're watching the play and, you know, the chaplain becomes suddenly a general or a soldier, right? Same actor, same guy, different costume, different character. The whole point is to remind you that you're just watching a play, that this isn't real, that this is all dramatic illusion. We also see characters frequently breaking into song and dance routines. Something ordinary people generally don't do. And if you are seeing people doing this a lot, you might want to lay off the magic mushrooms a little bit. Right? All of this designed to keep you from getting too wrapped up in the play. Now, <clears throat> There are reasons for this. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, Little Shop of Horrors? Either the musical or the movie. Do you know the musical or the movie, Taylor? Both. Both? Okay. And how are the musical and the movie different? Um, I did, it was in high school, so. Okay. Um, I know with the movie, it, there were parts, like, okay, the one character, the, mm -hmm. the main girl or whatever, uh -huh. in the book, she didn't seem as, like, out of it. Okay. But in the movie, like, mm -hmm. she, she, like, was really annoying and, <laughs> and sang all the time. Okay. And, like, I don't know. It was but just, the, the whole, the whole mm -hmm. concept yeah. is very different. But the big so, difference is the ending, right? Yes. How does the play end? Oh yes. He does die. Every, oh, all the characters, yeah. yeah. All the characters die yeah. at the end of the play. The plant eats them all, and the plant wins. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. The play. The play is about a carnivorous plant from outer space that's trying to take over the world. Um, in the movie, the hero and the heroine survive. Now, when the director of the film was asked about this, he said that he'd originally filmed it with the ending from the musical, but when they screened it for test audiences, they hated it. It really upset them. And he had to think about why. He's like, well, of course, right? When you go to see a play, when the play's over, the actors come back out and take a bow. You can see that they're okay, right? That everybody's fine. No one was eaten by a giant plant. When you go to see a movie, once those actors die, you don't see them again. So even if intellectually you understand that you're just watching a movie, you still get more emotionally involved because you're not, you don't see the stage mechanics in front of you. And what Brecht is trying to do is exactly what that director understood was happening in the difference between the movie and the musical, that he wants to show you all of the stage mechanics so that you understand the argument of the play. And the argument is essentially
anti-war and anti-capitalist. Right. These two for Brecht are, these two ideas are intimately connected with each other. And I think it would probably help if we sort of teased out a little bit how these things intersect in the play and how he's putting this argument together. Now, if we look at the beginning of scene one, we have this conversation between a recruiter and a sergeant. Can I get a couple of volunteers? Can I get a recruiter and a sergeant? All right, you be the recruiter, Tola, and who wants to be the sergeant? Sergeants, anybody? Okay. Darius. Darius will be the sergeant, okay. All right, recruiter, go. Country road near a town, a sergeant and a recruiter stand shivering. This is the part that says, how the hell can you line up? Is that the beginning? Yes, although it looks like you're working from a slightly different translation, but yeah, go ahead. How the hell can you line up a squadron in a place like this? You know what I keep thinking about, sergeant? Suicide. I'm supposed to knock four platoons together by the 12th. Four platoons the chief asking me for, asking for. And they're so friendly around here. I'm scared to go to sleep at night. Suppose I do get my hands on, the, on some character and squint at him so I don't notice he's pigeon chested and has varicose veins. Mm -hmm. I think him drunk and relaxed. He signs on the dotted line. I pay for the drink. He steps outside for a minute. I have a hunch I should follow him to the door. And I might. And am I right? Away he gone. Away he's gone like a louse from a scratch. He can't take a man's word anymore. Sergeant, there's no loyalty left in the world. No trust, no faith, no sense of honor. I'm losing my confidence in mankind, Sergeant. It's too awesome they had a war here. It stands to reason. Where does their sense of mortality come from? Peace, that's just a mess. It takes a war to make order. Peace time, and human race runs wild. People and cattle get buggered, well, who cares? Everyone eats just as he feels inclined. A hunk of cheese on top of his nice white bread and a slice of flat on top of the cheese. How many young block, how many young block, blokes. blokes and good horses in that town there? Nobody knows, they never bought, they never thought of counting. I've been in places, I ain't seen a war for night 70 years. Folks that ain't got names to them, can't tell one another part apart. It takes a war to get proper norm, normal roles and inventories, shoes and bundles and corn and bags, and a man and beast properly numbered and prayed off. Because it stands to reason, no order, no war. It's the God's truth. Oh, you, oh you, you, you guys can stop, actually. It was just, just those two, uh, those two passages I wanted you guys to read. So thank you both very much. Um, so one thing to note about what the recruiter says, right? How easy a time is he having getting people to join up? It's a pretty hard time. Yeah, he's having a really rough time getting people to join up, right? People will sign up take the money and run away. And what kind of people is he forced to try to recruit? Uh, the lowest low, criminals, just vagabonds. Well, are they necessarily criminals? If we look at the way he describes them physically, right? he has to squint at them to ignore their pigeon chests and varicose veins. Is he recruiting people who are impressive physical specimens? Yeah. All the, you know, all the skinny little pipsqueaks and the unhealthy people who weren't conscripted initially, right? What does this suggest about the way the war is going? Not so good. Yeah, generally not so good, right? If they have to scoop up all of the unhealthy people to fill out the units, the war is going rather badly. Why does he think they should fight? What does he think they ought to be fighting for? What does he bemoan in these people? Whole we'll sign. Loyalty, but, no, faith, no honor. Yep. Loyalty, faith, and honor, right? This is supposed to be a war of religion.
It started over a religious dispute in what is now the Czech Republic. But by the time we start this play, there are Catholic nations fighting on the Protestant side and Protestant nations fighting on the Catholic side. And it's more about power, prestige, and grabbing land than it is about religion, yes. Didn't the um, Ottoman Empire get involved? Yeah, and the Ottoman Empire really didn't have a dog in the Protestant Catholic fight. They're Sunni, they're just like, yeah. The yeah, the Ottomans were involved. Well, yeah, they, they were looking to get what they could get out of it. Now, what about the sergeant? What, what does the sergeant think is good about war? Um, in peacetime, nothing's structured, nothing's ordered, no inventories mm -hmm. are taken. Um, right. And why doesn't you don't know how many people are in a village, you don't know how much yeah. they have. And why yeah, and why doesn't inventory need to be taken in peacetime? Why don't you need to count up cattle or people? You don't have to um, fund and feed an army. Yeah. You don't have to fund and feed an army, yeah. And it also seems like in peacetime everybody's got enough, right? people don't actually need to count up what they have because everybody's getting enough to eat. You know, slice of cheese on top of your nice white bread and all that, right? Well, they're on it too. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> making up inventories, counting, imposing order, all of these things are necessary for a business enterprise, right? If you don't know how much of something there is, you don't know how much to charge for it. You don't know who'll buy it. Right? First step is counting up your inventory. It takes a war to get that going. Now what else does war bring? Why do you need to start counting stuff up during the war? It's not just to feed the army. What, is, what, what do things become? What do we see soldiers and other sort of pe lower class people in the play always complaining about? Food? Yeah, there isn't enough, right? Scarcity drives prices up. This is how Mother Courage makes her money. Oh, well, so much for that. She sells things that are otherwise hard to get and is able to charge an arm and a leg for them. Meanwhile, what are the soldiers expected to fight for? The material things. Yeah, this is a war of religion, son. You're fighting for your salvation, right? You're fighting for loyalty, faith, and honor. Whereas we see time and again, soldiers complaining about the way they're treated by their officers. Right? We've been seen four with a song of the grand capitulation. This young soldier comes running in. He says, where's that bleeding pig of a captain What's took my reward money to swig with his tarts? I'll do him. Shut up, they'll put you in irons. Out of there, you thief. I'll slice you into pork chops, I will. Pocketing my prize money after I'd swum the river, only one of the whole squadron, and now I can't even buy myself a beer. I'm not standing for that. Come on out here so I can cut you up. So the officers take and pocket the money that's supposed to go to the soldiers and expect the soldiers to perform anyway, right? In the following scene, there's a soldier complaining that you know he wants his schnapps, the general didn't allow enough looting in the town. So he still doesn't have any money. At the commander in chief's funeral in scene six, page, on page 47, To the clerk, Mother Courage says, 
I'm only letting in sergeants and up. Commander in chief have been having his worries, they say. Supposed to have been trouble with the second regiment because he stopped their pay, said it was a war of faith and they should do it for free. So the soldiers are expected to fight for ideals. What's the problem with ideals? Ideals don't put food on the table. Yeah, you can't eat them, right? That's the problem here that the, that the play is pointing out. You can't eat loyalty, faith, and honor. And one of the things that these armies do as they tromp across Europe is burn the crops and kill the cattle so that the enemy has nothing to eat. And then they end up starving themselves as well. Right? The general doesn't even have any church bells for his funeral. because I heard they wanted to toll bells for the funeral as usual, except it turned out all churches have been blown to bits uh, by his orders. So poor old commander-in-chief won't be hearing no bells as they let the coffin down. Right? It's just mindless, senseless destruction even of the things they claim to be protecting. And who's expected to take all the risks? The common soldiers, yeah. People without feeding. Yeah, if an officer dies, it's by accident. Why is the sergeant so surprised when he draws the, draws the black cross in the first scene? He's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, I always stay in the back. I don't go on the front lines. Page 47, the same general who would cut the pay of the 2nd Regiment. Too bad about Commander-in-Chief, 22 pair of those socks. He fell by accident, they say. Missed over fields, that was the trouble. General had just been haranguing a regiment, saying he must fight to last man and last round. He was riding back when mist made him lose direction, so he was up front and a bullet got him in the midst of battle. General's not supposed to be up front. General's not supposed to be taking risks. But, in the fog and confusion, he gets it just the same. Now, what does the general level of competence of the people in command seem to be? Not very high. Why would you say not very high? They're keeping pay from their soldiers and expecting them to fight mm -hmm. efficiently. Yeah, well, if there's, if there's nothing to feed them, right? If, they've, you know, if there's no food anywhere for anyone, but the war continues anyway, right? The war continues to grind on, even as resources that keep it going are exhausted. People and food. I want to call your attention to page 15. Mother Courage makes an editorial comment about the competence of this general. Mother Courage, who has been listening and now angrily plucks the fowl. That must be a rotten general. He's ravenous all right, but why rotten? Because he's got to have men of courage, that's why. If he knew how to plan a proper campaign, what would he be needing men of courage for? Ordinary ones would do. It's always the same. Whenever there's a load of special virtues around, it means something stinks. I thought it meant things is all right. No, that they stink. Look, suppose some general or king is bone stupid and leads his men up shit creek. Then those men have got to be fearless. There's another virtue for you. Suppose he's stingy and hires too few soldiers. They got to be a crowd of Herculeses. And suppose he's slapdash and don't give a bugger. Then they got to be clever as monkeys else their number's up. Same way they got to show exceptional loyalty each time he gives them impossible jobs. Not but virtues no proper country and no decent king or general would ever need. In decent countries, folk don't have to have virtues. The whole lot can be perfectly ordinary, average intelligence, and for all I know, cowards. 
So if there are a lot of virtues running around, if there are a lot of special people with special qualities running around, what does that say about the general state of the world or the country? That it's bad, yeah. Why do people need virtues in this kind of situation? Yeah, just to survive, right? They've got to be especially clever, or especially brave, or especially strong, to survive the stupid situations that their leaders put them into. In a well-run, well-governed country, according to Mother Courage's logic, no one needs to be special. No one needs to have virtues because everybody's got enough. No one has to really worry about anything. But how good are virtues over the course of the play at actually keeping you out of trouble and keeping you alive? Yeah, they don't work out so well for her kids, right? look in uh, scene nine, the song that the cook sings to the parsonage when he's begging for soup. Right, the song of the virtues. You saw sagacious Solomon. You know what came of him. To him, complexity seemed plain. He cursed the hour that gave birth to him and saw that everything was vain. How great and wise was Solomon. The world, however, didn't wait but soon observe what followed on. It's wisdom that had brought him to this state. How fortunate the man with none. You saw a courageous Caesar next. You know what he became. They deified him in his life, then had him murdered just the same. And as they raised the fatal knife, how loud he cried, you too, my son. The world, however, didn't wait, but soon observe what followed on. It's courage that had brought him to that state. How fortunate the man with none. You heard of honest Socrates, the man who never lied. They weren't so grateful as you'd think. Instead, the rulers fixed to have him tried and handed him the poison drink. How honest was the people's noble son. The world, however, didn't wait, but soon observed what followed on. It's honesty that brought him to that state. How fortunate the man with none. St. Martin couldn't bear to see his fellows in distress. He met a poor man in the snow and shared his cloak with him, we know. Both of them, therefore, froze to death. His place in heaven was surely won. The world, however, didn't wait, but soon observed what followed on. Unselfishness had brought him to that state. How fortunate the man with none. And each of these figures in the song corresponds to one of the children, right? Eilif has the characteristics of Solomon and of Caesar. He even says in that second scene that, you know, uh, or he's told by the general he has the makings of a young Caesar. Swiss cheese is honest like Socrates. Katrin is unselfish like St. Martin. And all their virtues did for them was get them killed. So virtue, if it's a survival strategy, is a pretty lousy one, at least in the world set up by the play. So what are the best ways to survive in a harsh world according to Brent's logic. Well, we can see that there are two groups of people that on certain levels make out okay. Right, let's return <coughs> for a moment to the chaplain, the cook, and Yvette. Right, these camp followers that we talked about a, a moment ago. Now, what do they all have in common with each other? They're the, um, they're followers. Yeah, they're, well, yeah, on the one, they are all camp followers, right? That they're not, they don't fight, but they're sort of parasites living off of the army, right?
Where's Yvette at the end, by the end of the play? She got a child in the cabin. Yeah. She's no longer Yvette the Flemish prostitute, right? By the end of the play, she is the Countess Starenberg. Right, she gets her hooks into the older brother of the elderly colonel who was going to buy her Mother Courage's cart. The cook inherits that family in in the Netherlands and is just going to go back there and make his living off of that. And the chaplain gets to return to his preaching, but is this preach, is this chaplain a peacemaker, a healer of wounds from conflict? No. How does he regard his faith? What is, he, what is his preaching intended to do? Stir up trauma and war sometimes? Yeah. <clears throat> He's not trying to heal the wounds of war, bring people together. What he preaches to do is fire soldiers up so they'll fight harder. Right, we look on page 52. Right. I studied to be a pastor of souls. My talents and abilities are being abused in this place by manual labor. My God-given endowments are denied expression. It's a sin. You have never heard me preach. One sermon of mine can put a regiment in such a frame of mind, it'll treat the enemy like a flock of sheep. Life to them is a smelly old footcloth, which they fling away in a vision of final victory. God has given me the gift of speech. I can preach so you'll lose all sense of sight and hearing. So the people who make out the best by riding out the war are the unscrupulous. Right, Mother Courage herself still has her cart by the end of the play. But do, you, do the play's sympathies lie with the unscrupulous? Who else right. do we see? Oh, go ahead, Darius. Are you saying the unscrupulous are the three main characters? I mean, three kids. Pardon? <coughs> what you, what you saying? Are we supposed to agree that being unscrupulous and looking out for number one is the best way to survive a harsh situation? Are looking out for yourself? Yeah. yeah. Do you think that's what the play suggests? Because the people who survive mm -hmm. kind of like looking out for themselves and like the more people who like the kind and the honest people, they're mm -hmm. the most killed. Yeah, the kind and the honest people tend to die. But what they do, um, when Swiss cheese is passed by his mother, he won't. He lies for the first time in his life, basically. Mm -hmm. Says, no, I don't know that one. Yeah. To save her. Yeah. Um, Catherine gives her life, saving an entire city from being raised mm -hmm. by an army. Mm -hmm. um, Elon is just trying to feed his fellow soldiers. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. In the end, even though his actions are questionable. And whose fault is it that the three of them are drawn into the conflict in the first place? The yeah, it all comes back to mother, right? To mother and her cart. <coughs> There's a scene that doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the play. Scene 10. It's on page 74. Mother Courage and Katrin are dragging their cart past a peasant's house in which side there, inside which there is a voice singing. The roses in our arbor delight us with their show. They have such lovely flowers, repaying all our labor <coughs> after the summer showers. Happy are those with gardens now, they have such lovely flowers. When winter winds are freezing, as through the woods they blow, our home is warm and pleasing, we fix the thatch above it, with straw and moss we wove it. Happy are those with shelter now, when winter winds are freezing. Mother Courage and Katrin pause to listen, then continue pulling. 
what is this scene doing here, especially so close to the end of the play? It's short. There are no soldiers anywhere here, right? This is one of the only scenes in which we don't see any military personnel wandering around. So what is this meant to do? What is this meant to show us? How are these peasants different from Mother Courage? They're not caught up in the war. Yeah. They're settled people on their own land, taking care of their own home, minding their own business, yeah. content with what they have. And I think that that's probably the survival strategy that Brecht is arguing for. <coughs> if you don't let yourself get caught up in war and materialism in the first place, then you don't suffer from them. All right, so we're about out of time. Uh, that's all I have for you. Make sure you turn in your in-class writings as you leave. And we'll see you on Monday.